Hey, this is Doc Mike, the Redneck Dentist, here on Real Liberty Media. I'd like to invite you to listen to some other shows here on Real Liberty Media. We have Behind the Woodshed, evolutionarily engaging in counter-propaganda tactics and related work with Hal Anthony. We also have It's All Connected with Grimner and Circle. They connect all the dots. The subject doesn't matter. The connections are real and tangible. Also, we have Free Your Mind with Grimner and Moose Girl. You can break from thought constraints on the scope of your vision only by realizing those limits that have been presented to you do not apply to you. They are not real. Those concepts make people feel comfortable by giving them thought boundaries. This is the Free Your Mind show with Moose Girl and Grimner. Sit back and listen and see your way beyond the world as it has been defined. We have a ponder gander with Vinny. To think and reason, raising expectations through thought-provoking episodes. If you cannot do great things, do small things in a great way. On Sundays, you can sit back and relax and enjoy some music from Grimner. He broadcasts the Sunday Blues Show live on Sundays from noon to 3 p.m. Eastern Time. He plays all kinds of blues from great oldies like Robert Johnson, Howlin' Wolf, and John Lee Hooker to the most modern hard-rocking blues from Joe Bonamassa, Poppy Chubby, and Samantha Fish, and all of the stuff between, like Stevie Ray Vaughan, Jack Falk Project, and Gary Moore. He also plays blues music from classic rock bands, the Rolling Stones, ZZ Top, and Cream. And while he's playing the music, we are in the Real Liberty Media chat on irc.freenode.net playing a rousing game of trivia. So come on over and join us every Sunday for some great tunes, fun trivia, and great chat. We also have a show, The Top Ten Countdown. Gary L. and Gigi's Boo play the top ten songs from years gone by, and they provide some interesting historical facts and trivia about the songs and the era. These are all great shows with great content and inspiring messages. Come spend some time with us. Get to know us, and we will get to know you. Also, if you love what you hear and want to represent, we have Real Liberty Media here. You will love the artwork and it will inspire conversation. Check out our Amazon.com store and Real Liberty Media goods from our website, reallibertymedia.com. This is Doc Mike, the Redneck Dentist, here on Real Liberty Media. I hope I'm coming through okay. We're going to make some adjustments here if we need to. It's good to see you all. Thanks for listening to my show. Thanks for joining us on Real Liberty Media. Uh, It's been a great day so far for me. I wanted to start off, I think I'm going to include a segment every week. I'm going to call it uh, the Redneck Moment of the Week because we definitely had one today. And uh, I want to share it with you because it's, you know, I I guess sometimes I feel like I have to justify being a redneck. (laughs) So people don't always only think of me as a dentist. Um, You know, that's what I do to make a living. And otherwise I live. So this is what we had to do. I'm going to give you a little bit of background before I go into it. We had some neighbors move in. Uh, to the property next to ours. It's another five-acre lot, and uh, they have they have horses. Now, their property is pretty steep. So, you know, and they're really pretty young kids. They're like 20 years old, no kidding. Like, I was talking to the guy the other day, and I said, well, how old are you anyway? And he said 20. So, we, when we saw them moving in, you know, I was like, man, you guys you guys should put your horses up on our property because it's a little flatter and they have more, you know, grazing opportunity and uh, just would work out better. So they did move their horses up here. But what happened was there were four horses on this five acres and it was a really wet fall and winter and it got really muddy. And so we had to, We had to repair the field. So basically, we were going to, um, we were going to reseed it. So this is how we did it. Of course, the last couple weeks, you guys know I've been tilling up, you know, tilling the dirt. It's been dry enough to get a good till in it. 
and leveling it out and getting rid of some rocks and stuff. Anyway, we moved the horses up to only the north pasture, which is about two and a half acres. Really nice and flat and uh, a lot of grass starting to grow up there. And it didn't get really kind of torn apart like the lower two acres did. So my wife and I decided we were going to we are going to replant it with some mixed grasses and uh, maybe a little clover in there too. So anyway, I tilled up, oh, a good part of the two acres. It didn't all have to be tilled, but uh, quite a bit of it did. So I tilled it up. We got it nice and level. We raked it, and then uh, we were going to spread some seed. So we are going to try and make it, you know, efficient. So we uh, so we got the quad and we hooked up a trailer, a little kind of a dump trailer to the quad, and we put the seed in there. It's a 50-pound bag of seed or so. And the only spreader we had is this hand spreader. You've probably seen them, like you hold it with one hand and you crank with the other and it spreads the seed. Well, uh, the quad has really low gear, which is nice. So, you know, we could go really slowly, and I guess I was elected to be the driver, and she was going to be the spreader. So we put the seed in the little dump trailer, and she sat in the trailer, and then had the spreader in her hand, and then I would just kind of put along real slow, and she would spread the seed. Well, we got about an acre and a half or something done, and, um, and, uh, I was making a turn kind of at the lower end of the property. And I mean, I was going really slow, too. I mean, really slow. You can imagine we're spreading seed, trying to get a good concentration of seed in the dirt. So with a little hand spreader, it didn't want to go too fast or it'd be really sparse. But anyway, she was kind of leaning on the side of the wagon or trailer. And um, yeah, she went over. <laughs> Luckily, we were just about done uh, spreading the seed, so there wasn't much seed left in the bucket, and there wasn't much seed left in the spreader, but uh, yeah, everything got dumped out. The trailer just went over, and she was she was sitting there in the dirt on her hands and knees for a minute, and she's fine. We're fine. We were laughing about it. She goes, yeah, you should, uh, you should mention that on your show, so... Is pretty funny. Anyway, we got most, I think we pretty much uh, did everything we tilled, which is cool. Now we can work on our little garden spot. But uh, just thought I'd share the redneck moment with you. And, uh, you know, I mean, we probably could go out and buy some seed spreader and use it for fertilizer and seed and all that stuff. But you know, you work with what you got, and that's what we had, and we got it accomplished, so I think it's all good. All right, so in uh, last week, I was talking about uh, meat goats, and I said I would do a little uh, segment on meat goats. And personally, like I had some goats, I had milk goats, and I had meat goats, until I opened a practice down in Springfield, which is 90 miles away, and then I couldn't travel every day, so um, we got rid of the goats. But I do have, I, I had them for maybe, uh, I don't know, 10 years, I think, something like that. And I wanted to talk about the benefits of goats on even a small bit of property. So, and, you know, a good reason why raising meat goats is a good idea and it's it doesn't cost a lot that's another kind of good thing about goats is you do have to take care of them um depending on where you live i think you need to give them uh you need to give them a, a parasite injection once in a while because of the way they feed eating so it's just kind of cool you can put goats in the same field as you uh, in the same field with horses or cows because those animals, horses and cows, are grazers and goats are browsers. So what a goat does is it'll eat the tops off of 
like tall grasses or vines or uh, shrubs, bushes, they'll kind of keep that stuff in check, which is actually kind of cool because one thing is it keeps those uh, weeds, basically, or annoying bits of brush, they keep them in check, which means you don't need to use chemicals on your pasture land to keep them in check. You just let the goats do it. And then the good part about that is you can convert, you know, goats to meat and eat the meat or sell the meat. And instead of spending money on chemicals, you actually are getting money or getting nutrition from your goats eating the weeds. It's kind of a beneficial relationship. So anyway, and the other thing that you have to do with goats, uh, with all goats, is you have to trim their hooves because their hooves grow, you know, it's basically a toenail. And they will grow too much, I guess, unless you have real, some really coarse, harsh terrain for them to run and play on. Maybe they would keep them in check like that. But still, I think you have to trim them once in a while. And I'll tell you, it was my least favorite thing about about having goats. Because, um, uh, you know, they don't like being held down, I guess, not held down. What This is what I would do. I would, all my goats had collars on, and I would snub them to a fence. Like I would take their collar and literally clip it to the fence so their head was right next to the fence. So basically they had limited options of where they could go. Like they couldn't really move. They could squirm a little bit, but they couldn't really get away from me or fight too much. But they do. They don't like it, you know, any more than any other critter does, I guess. But you do have to trim their hooves and uh, give them that parasite medication. Uh, I can't remember what it's called. I, I want to say Invermectin, but I could be wrong. It doesn't matter. If you ever decide to... to uh, take up raising goats, you know, there's a couple good books out there, there's websites out there, people, uh, there's goat associations that will help you with, uh, you know, with getting started. And, I mean, goats are pretty dang cheap too, so, you know, it's not like they're a real expensive animal to get started. And, you know, when you raise your own meat, you, you kind of have a benefit of knowing what went into that uh meat and um, what, uh, you know, how, how that animal was treated and if it lived a good life, if you give it a good life, it's going to return good nutrition to you. Now that, you know, that means, of course, you got to have some breeding goats and it also means that you're going to slaughter some goats because uh, that's how you get meat. And uh, one thing about goat meat, and I, maybe I mentioned this before. Um, oh, I did because somebody kind of forced me to tell this this little bit of trivia last week. But male goats, when they hit puberty, they they uh, basically spray themselves with ur urine and sperm, and they spray it right on their beard or their neck. I mean, of course, who knows how good a shot they are, but if you've ever smelled goats, it's the male goat you're smelling because females actually, you know, there's really no odor or offensive odor to female goats, but male goats, on the other hand, yeah, they stink. And anyway, so you want to make sure you butcher those male kids before they reach that age because I made the mistake one time of waiting too long and I had a male kid that had uh, been spraying himself. It's kind of like that's their perfume so they can attract females. Anyway, uh, and of course when you raise your own meat, and I would think that in general you, you would want to, you kind of want to make sure you use all the animal, that you're not going to raise some animals for sustenance and then, not use as much of the animal as you can. 
So, you know, I was trying to, I'll tell you, I made a curry, some kind of a curry mix with this goat meat and uh, mainly from the neck of this goat because because I wanted to use everything I could I knew this was going to be the worst part and I'm telling you that scent had soaked into the meat and I couldn't figure I'm I'm sure maybe there's some way you can get rid of it or maybe minimize that smell but that smell kind of converts to taste and it's horrible <laughs> and to try I, I made a curry sauce and tried to I had like one bite and I was like okay that was pretty bad but um, maybe I can get through this and I couldn't man as soon as I would get it under my nose about to go in my mouth and I got that whiff of scent I was like nope I, I can't do it so I think he ended up feeding it to the dogs or something but by the way goat meat is delicious it's just like a regular red meat uh, it's really it's really actually very similar to beef or I guess pork is considered a red meat although it's not really red um, but it, I mean it's just meat you know so many I think people might get hung up on it being a goat but really it's just meat it's kind of like uh, no, I'm not going to get it. I was going to say it's kind of like rabbits. You know, rabbit meat is is pretty white, and people might think it's like chicken, but it's not. I raised uh, I raised rabbits also, and uh, I do like rabbit. Man, that's another meat crop that you can get going really rapidly. But today we're focusing on goats, and I wanted to tell you a couple other benefits of raising goats. Number one is goat milk I might only have one other great reason for raising goats but goat milk is actually good for you and some of you may know that when there's children that are lactose intolerant they can actually sometimes tolerate goat milk and actually the doctors will recommend that the moms get goat milk and of course they can't go to a local farm and get goat milk because you can't actually sell goat milk Unless you go through a bunch of ho hoops and get USDA approval and all that stuff. But I know for a fact that what people will do is they will sell that milk for other purposes. Let's say somebody comes to you and says, well, I have a goat and I need milk for that goat for whatever reason. Well, you can sell them milk for non-human consumption, but you can't sell milk for human consumption unless you have all that, um, I don't know, USDA approval or whatever it is. But I'll tell you, we used to, so when I started uh, raising goats, man, I can't believe already almost 20 minutes has gone by. That, that's crazy because I have way too much stuff to talk about to fit into an hour. But anyway, um when we started drinking goat milk, I was shocked at how delicious it was. And when we would have people come over to our house and we would talk about goat milk or goat cheese, and we would, uh, oh, thanks. Thanks, Grimner. I might, I might not. We'll see, because it doesn't matter. But anyway, we would have people come over. Uh, I just got the okay to go longer, but... Uh, we'll see how that goes. Anyway, uh, we would have people come over and they would turn their nose up if we told them about, you know, milking the goats. And, and uh, heck, we always had so much milk. I mean, we'd have, I'd probably get about three gallons of milk in the refrigerator before I would make some cheese because that's a good way to use goat milk um, if you can't drink it all. But we would have people come over, and then if they turn their nose up and we ask them if they'd like to try it, and they, if they said yes, we this is how we would do it. We would have them leave the room, and we would pour two glasses of milk for each person. One glass would be the store-bought milk, and one glass would be goat milk. And both of them would be cold, fresh out of the refrigerator, and we give them a couple Oreo cookies or whatever cookies we had around at the time. 
And then we'd have them come back in and let them drink both milks and decide which one was better. And we never had one single person pick the store-bought milk. Never one time. And when we told them that what they picked as the better milk was goat milk, and they didn't believe us, we would pour it fresh out of the pitcher for them, and then they understood how good that milk was. I'm telling you, it's crazy good. And I'm going to tell you a couple scientific things about goat milk and cow milk. One thing is, cow milk is not naturally homogenized. Homogenized means the fat particles are all the same size. They did that originally to make the milk last longer when it's on the shelf. So what they do is they either, there's some way they break down the fat globules so they're all the same size. That's what homogenized means. Now when you homogenize cow milk, you create a protein called casease. Caseyase, once you ingest it and it gets in your body, it actually promotes the formation of cholesterol in your arteries. So it's not one of the greatest things you can drink. We do need cholesterol in our body, so cholesterol we can't do without it, but you don't want to have too much of it. Now, goat milk is naturally homogenized. All the fat particles are the same size. So you don't have to do anything to goat milk to homogenize the fats. And it's better for you because you don't get that caseyase protein that's created when you homogenize milk. And then you don't get the cholesterol formation that comes with it. Um, it also makes it, I, I think I remember something about it making it more difficult to make goat butter because it's hard to separate the cream. Uh, and I could kind of see that because we we would, it's not like a, I don't remember it being a clear difference of a layer of cream on top of the milk, but uh, it is delicious. Anyway, so some there's some benefits to raising goats. One is land management because they take care of brush and weeds and annoying other things that your cattle or horses don't eat. Uh, they provide meat and they provide milk and they're not very expensive and they don't take a lot of maintenance. Uh, it's easy to learn to take care of goats. And uh, sometimes you have some disasters. I do remember uh, I had to put at least one goat down because she got sick. She got the parasites. Uh, for whatever reason, I didn't do the parasite control as I should. And man, when they start going downhill, if you don't catch them quick, and get them fixed up, and that was my best milker too. It really bummed me out that she that I had to put her down. But uh, anyway, so this is one thing that you could look into doing to uh, provide meat for your family. Uh, if you're, you know, if you're thinking about doing that, I, I wanted to talk about. It. I think they're one of the most beneficial animals that you can raise. Uh, if you have any kind of property, just for, like I said, land management and stuff like that. Okay, moving along. Um, I wanted to I wanted to discuss this this uh, thing I came across in the last uh, week or so. It's called learned helplessness, and I don't know if any of you have read this uh, study that was done. I don't know how I came up. I do know how I came across it. I don't know why. I do know why it caught my attention, and we're going to get to it. But I want to read you this little bit of a story first. And of course, as always, in my blog notes, my show notes, my blog notes for the show, the links will be in there so that you can read this stuff yourself. And I always like going to the original source so originally, this story started out from a site called the Corbett Report, uh, CorbettReport.com. That'll be in the show notes. Uh, this guy, I think, is pretty smart. I'm going to read you a little bit of the story, and then we're going to get into the study a little bit. And there, you'll see where I'm going with this. It has everything to do with kind of the uh, abuse of power that we've been under for uh, over a year now. Let me see if I can read this. It says, imagine 
You find a prisoner in an unlocked jail cell. Confused, you ask him why he's sitting there with the door to his cell when the door to his cell isn't even locked. Oh, it's unlocked? I didn't check, he says. You assure him it's unlocked and ask him again why he doesn't leave. Why bother? They'll probably just catch me. They'll probably catch me before I get out. You look around in confusion. You explain to him that this isn't even a real jail, that he's simply been told to wear an orange jumpsuit and stay in an unlocked room, but he doesn't have to comply. All he has to do is leave. Even if I get away, they'll find me and bring me back here. Might as well just stay put. Do you think this story is ridiculous? Of course it is, but the situation it describes is all too true. In fact, researchers have known for half a century the mechanism by which people can be made to effectively lock themselves up inside their own mental prison, and it didn't take long for the intelligence agencies to put that research to use. So, the study came from a guy named Seligman in 2001. He Oh, wait a minute. Oh, yeah. So I'm going to tell you about this study, and I'm not going to read it because I think I can get it. I can get the idea through to you without actually going step by step. But there will be a reference to this study in the show notes. So basically, this guy Seligman um, created a situation, and I'm sorry if you – I love animals. I love dogs. He used dogs for his study, and basically this is what he did. He made a device like a chamber where it had electrified floors. There was a barrier between one side and the other. So if the dog was on the electrified side and received an electrical shock that was painful or uncomfortable, whatever you want to call it, um, there was an opportunity for the dog to jump over the barrier to get to the side that wasn't electrified to escape the painful shock. So basically what would happen is the dog would learn quickly that all he had to do was jump over the barrier to stop receiving this uncomfortable shock. So in another chamber, there was no escape. For the dog and the dog I'm not going to go into detail but let's just say the dogs in the chambers where there was no escape eventually they would just lay down and accept the shock they would ex there was no other choice and so Seligman uh, described that as learned helplessness, that there was no possible way for the dog to get away from the shock, so he would just give up and accept the shock. Now, I guess he did some kind of an experiment then where he dropped the barrier or put a barrier inside the box, and if the dog jumped over, to the other side, it was not electrified and he could escape the shock, but even then, the dogs would stay on the shock side and not leave and to escape the shock. It's kind of interesting. But what happened was Seligman was the kind of guy he didn't want to he didn't want to do research and harm animals without some positive changes or some positives coming out of his research to benefit humans. So, in 2001, he pioneered a new branch of cognitive psychology called positive psychology, with which he sought to help people overcome their learned helplessness. As part of that work, Seligman delivered a lecture at a San Diego Naval Base in May 2002 on how this research could help American personnel, in his own words, to resist torture and evade successful interrogation by their captors. There was somebody in the audience, Dr. Jim Mitchell, a military retiree and psychologist who had contracted to provide training services to the CIA. 
Although Seligman had no idea at the time, Mitchell was, as we now know, one of the key architects of the CIA's, I'll quote, illegal torture program. Mitchell's interest in Seligman's talk was not how it could be applied to help American personnel overcome learned helplessness and resist torture, but rather how it could be used to induce learned helpless, helplessness in a CIA target and enhance torture. This was from a New York Times uh, report in 2009. Dr. Mitchell, colleagues said, believed that producing learned helplessness in al-Qaeda interrogation subjects might ensure that he would comply with his captors' demands. Many experienced interrogators disagreed, asserting that a prisoner so demoralized would say whatever he thought the interrogator expected. Well, if Mitchell got his way and... uh, Uh, Mitchell got his way, and equally unsurprisingly, those submitted to these techniques began to say whatever their interrogators expected, exactly as predicted. Mitchell and his colleague, Dr. Bruce Jensen, helped direct the 2002 interrogation of Abu Zabeda, who was waterboarded 83 times in a single month and was in the supposed 9-11 mastermind. Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, who confessed to the 9-11 plot after being waterboarded 183 times and sleep-deprived for over six days. Mitchell himself even personally threatened to cut the throat of KSM's son during one interrogation. These techniques were so effective that not only did they produce the testimony formed that formed the backbone of the 9-11 Commission report, and thus to this day, form the backbone of the official 9-11 story, they also caused KSM to to confess to targeting a bank that wasn't even founded until after his arrest. Talk about results. My point here is, somehow, and believe me, there's a lot to say about that study and the use of that in CIA integration, but that's not the reason I brought it up. The reason I brought it up is because it has struck me so kind of vividly how little people resist. I guess, for whatever reason, the idea of freedom and liberty has escaped a huge, a huge number of a huge percentage of the population of the United States and actually the world. Because the entire world has submitted to their governments or their, I I hate to say leaders because I really have a hard time believing these people are leaders, but so many people have so quickly kind of just given in to being locked down, to wearing a mask, to social distancing. And might I say, I was actually listening listening to a guy named Steve Dace, who's on uh, the Blaze Radio TV network, whatever you want to call it, and I was actually kind of surprised. He actually did the same math I did on my last episode and came up with the exact same results that such a small percentage of our population actually dies from COVID. And yet we, the entire population, not only of the United States, but of the world has reacted so, has so overly reacted to this bug. It's, it's amazing to me, but I have a feeling it's not anywhere near the end of this. I don't think this is going to be the last thing. There's going to be something else. And it may be a virus. It may be something else. I was looking at um, some um, technology. Uh, What was it? Uh, Mayorkas this week. I forget who he is. Uh, he's Department of Health and Human Services or God knows what. 
He was saying that the United States can no longer or isn't able to secure their uh, internet, their their you know their electronic uh, communication means that that they can't do it. So they need to bring in private partnerships to help secure their you know to help with cyber security for the US government which didn't surprise me a bit because you know look just looking at the uh election which I'm like I said I have so much to talk about I'm going to get confused let's just stick with this so let's say Mayorkas said we you know that we can't do our own cyber security which was obvious from the number of hacks that were that were perpetrated against the United States during the last election cycle. Let's say that that's clear evidence that, you know, we can't, that our, you know, that our security people, the people in the U.S. government who were hired for IT security, that they can't do it and can't keep up with it and that they were, you know, allowed, you know, several penetrations in several different states across the country to have other countries interfere with our elections. So we need to go with this private partnership. So here's my problem with that. And I, it was kind of funny because uh, I was thinking about cruise ships today and how they're trying to get back into business. You know, they want to go on a, they want to get their cruise business going and I mean cruise ships is just an example it could be anything I just happened to see a commercial on TV about these smaller cruise ships wanting to get back into business but governments all over the world are saying well you can't do that because you know you have to social distance you can't have people you know on ships and close quarters or with you know recirculated air God knows what other freaking restrictions they're putting on them and I was thinking okay so what if the ship, you know, cruise ship, just went ahead and did it or tried to go ahead and have a cruise? All the all the federal government or governments of the world would have to do, but let's just say in our case, the federal government, who would now, you know, let's say in their vision, have a, this public-private partnership with Internet security Folks, I imagine that is uh, Google, Microsoft. Oh, God, don't get me started on Microsoft this week. I'm telling you, I have a horror story about Microsoft. Wow, that was a big boom. Sounded like a cannon. Hope it wasn't. Um, anyway, so let's say the cruise ship is going to go on a cruise anyway, and they start to cruise. Well, all, you know, anybody who didn't want them to do that cruise would need to do then is, well, number one, they can probably hack into their electronics and prevent them from going. Number two, they could have uh, fake customers on the ship who would then send out, you know, tweets or, I don't know, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, whatever, to say that, that, that it was unsafe, that they got sick. And then, because the government is in charge uh, or the public-private partnership involves the government and the private partnership of whatever IT firm they decide to go with, they could suppress um, they could suppress uh, any truths about the trip, like that it was going great, that nobody was sick. And to give you an example of that currently, I saw a headline that YouTube removed 2.5 million dislikes of White House videos. So in other words, whatever videos the White House puts out, I can't even tell you, although I wish I could have found the soundbite of... Um, Oh, whoever it was who, it doesn't matter. But let's just take for an example. 2.5 million dislikes removed from White House videos. Why? I mean, is that really harmful that 2.5 million people disliked a video that the White House put out? I don't think it's harmful. I think 
it's probably healthy that we don't all believe the same things. I think it's probably healthy to have discussions one way or the other. And by the way, I'm over this right-left uh, uh, liberal conservative thing. And it's new to me to be over, over it. But I get it. You know, we're everybody's going to hell in a handbasket. It's just like different speeds or different approaches. You know, one uh, one faction might be taking you one way, one faction's taking the other way. It really doesn't matter. One point of the story that I was telling earlier that Corbett put out was that, um, you know, people go to the polls, you, you know, every cycle, and they vote, and nothing changes. I used to have this philosophy that I, I would try, <laughs> this is so stupid now looking back at it, I would try and vote so that there would be almost a perfect balance so that nobody would get anything done. Because some years ago, and I forget when, I bet it was 20 years ago or so, probably when you could actually start researching things on the internet. I wanted to see, because there were laws being passed that were stupid, and I'll give you an example, and I'm sorry that some people died because of this, but one example was a TV that fell on a kid in a store and killed him. And I thought to myself, there had to have been, somebody had to create new laws to, I guess, strap the TVs to the wall or prevent them from falling. And I thought, really? I mean, we really just need common sense about this stuff. Number one, don't put TVs so close to whatever that they fall over. And number two, keep your damn kids off the TVs. I And I don't know if that's what happened, but it seems to me it's probably pretty hard for a TV to just fall off a freaking shelf by itself. Kind of like guns killing people. I mean, guns don't kill people. We all know that. But Lord knows we need more gun laws. Oh, by the way, yeah, no guns yesterday. It was a knife and a car. So I guess we have to ban knives and cars next. Oh, so did I get totally off track of what the hell I was talking about? Maybe so. Oh, yeah, that's what I was saying. It's like 20 years ago, or I don't know when it was, I, I, I was tired of the federal government and state governments coming up with more freaking laws. And it was like, man, why do, uh, you know, uh, God did it with Ten Commandments. Do we really need 1,500 new laws every year or 15,000 every four? Seriously, do we need that many more laws, but we do if you want to keep a population in check. If you want to have ultimate control, then you just keep making laws until there is nothing unregulated. So my goal was always <laughs> when I voted wasn't for somebody to win necessarily. It wasn't for my my personal agendas to be satisfied. It was that they would stop making freaking laws. <laughs> I think, you know, I'm a dentist, okay? If you, and I am not kidding about this, if you saw how many times I had to sign my name before I can treat a patient. You would be shocked. And you wonder why, you know, healthcare, dentistry, or whatever is so expensive. The legal paperwork that has to be in order before I do something to protect me to protect the corporation, to protect the patient, to protect my employees or whatever, uh, uh, to protect the staff. It's amazing. I'm not kidding. I, I remember one time, this was back in 95 or 6, 7, something like that. 
the guy who was in charge of the entire Billings area, I was on an Indian reservation then. I was a dentist on an Indian reservation, the, the Lame Deer, uh, Lame Deer uh, Indian Reservation. And the guy who was in charge of billing, Billings area, which included other reservations in Montana, Wyoming, I don't know, some other areas up there. I'm not kidding. He would have a, he would, so he sat in the office in Billings. You know, he didn't, I don't know if he did dentistry or not. My impression was, no, he, he didn't do dentistry. He was an office guy, an administrator. Anyway, once a month we would have a meeting where all the area, the chief dental officers of, of each uh, dental clinic would get on the phone with the, with the area dental officer and he would kind of see, you know, take the pulse of what was going on and tell us, you know, what we needed to concentrate on as far as, you know, increasing the dental care of our populations or whatever. And then, I am not kidding you, almost every single month, but at least every other month, this guy would say, hey, and we're going to do a, we're going to collect some data and uh, we're going to study and fill in the blank with whatever the hell you want to fill it in with. We're going to study whatever. And whenever I heard the words, we're going to collect data, I knew that meant there was another piece of freaking paper that I was going to have to fill out so some moron sitting in the office can, you know, manipulate that data to say whatever it was they were trying to get it to say. And it would always piss me off. And one time I finally said, this was shortly before I left, <laughs> which may have had something to do with it. Finally, I said to him one time, because this was this was the thing he would always say, look, he would say, it's only going to take you like another 60 seconds to fill out this form. <laughs> and after a couple years, let's say he did a new, you know, data form every two months. So in 24 months, you'd have 12 new forms. That's 12 minutes. That's 12 more minutes of your appointment time that you have to set aside to fill out freaking forms. Now, not everybody has data forms to fill out. Luckily today, you know, when I do, when I do whatever it is I do, yeah, it's input into a computer and somebody else gets that data pretty rapidly and they can manipulate it however they want. And thank God I don't have to fill out a form for that. But basically, it takes uh, it takes time to fill out those forms. So I was always so my goal in the last fifteen or twenty years was hope to God that whoever got elected were at a stalemate, you know, and just couldn't get crap done because all they do, if you think about it, most of those people are lawyers. You know, most of the elected officials are lawyers. So it's like going to a surgeon to ask if you need surgery. The answer is more than likely going to be yes. Like if you get referred to a surgeon, you're basically going to be told that you're going to need surgery. Same as sending lawyers to the, you know, to the, it's the same as electing lawyers to the House of Representatives or the Senate. They're basically going to figure out how to make more laws because that's what they've done if they've actually worked before they were elected officials. They worked as lawyers, either creating laws, defending laws, prosecuting laws, whatever, and then they get into office and uh, make more laws. It seems like that has never worked for me very well either. <laughs> it actually even seems like, you know, they're... Talk about learned helplessness. I think that applies very well to that situation. Every election cycle, we vote. Every election cycle, really nothing changes. It doesn't matter the faces that are elected. It doesn't matter the people, the color, the race, the religion that's elected. They all do the same thing. Nothing changes. I don't care... You remember uh, last episode I was talking about liars and, you know, I have my whole list of people that lie and lie for a living. Well, there you go. I mean, those people will say things. They'll say whatever they have to say to get elected. 
And then once they're elected, it's back to the same old thing. So yeah, I guess my my uh, myself, I have experienced, learned helplessness also. Although, I'll probably continue to vote. Like, why not? <laughs> Even though it's a complete waste of time. I don't know. Maybe it. Maybe it, if it does nothing more than allow me to bitch then maybe it's worth it for me. I don't know. Okay. I wanted to... Where are we at? Wow, 51 minutes. Not bad. Sorry, I hit the microphone there. Okay. Let's see. No, I did that. Um, I wanted to say... I'm. I hope that we're... I hope that more and more people are listening to our shows on Real Liberty Media. And I really want to encourage you to listen to the other voices on Real Liberty Media. There are some great ideas and conversations that come out of, uh, come out of Real Liberty Media. And I really enjoy it myself. Uh, I don't always have time to catch the shows live. In fact, I seldom catch the shows live, but I fill in space of my days by listening to the shows that are uh, in podcast form, which is awesome because then you can just, uh, you know, you can listen to them whenever, take them with you, portable. So it's pretty awesome. Oh, I did want to, and this will probably take the rest of my hour, and then I am going to probably call it quits, and I, I might just talk to Grimner about doing a Tuesday show. Uh, it seems like I have enough stuff to cover two hours probably fairly easily, so we'll see about that. But one of the things that I heard this week that immediately made my ears perk up, and I hope this happened to you also, was when you heard, if you heard, I don't know how many of you listen or watch the news, I'm always checking headlines to see what's going on. And I listen to certain types of personalities. And sometimes I'm listening live on the radio. Sometimes I'm listening to streams. Sometimes those are associated with um, broadcast entities that run commercials and news and weather and stuff like that. So when I heard earlier this week that the J and Z J and J vaccine, and I will do the air quotes around vaccine, was recalled due to human error. And something about the story, I kept hearing over and over again this human error. It's not like they said the J and J vaccine was recalled. Uh, 15 million doses of the J and J vaccine were recalled this week due to human error. It's not like they just said it once. They said it multiple times during the initial report of that uh, story. And when I kept hearing it in my ears, human error, the one thing I knew for certain is that it was not human error. I suppose that they're wanting us to believe that there's some dude in a white jacket with flasks and pipettes and test tubes mixing this vaccine together and putting it in little vials and, you know, licking his thumb and sticking the freaking cap on the bottle and putting it in a box. That's bullshit, 100% bullshit. It's not human error, I'm fairly certain. And the reason it was so important that they kept re saying, repeating over, number one, who, what batch of human beings is going to make 15 million doses of a vaccine or whatever nanoparticle crap they are putting in our bodies or wanting us, demanding that we get so we can continue with life. There's, there. I mean, that would be like a, I don't mean to be controversial, but that would be like human beings building the pyramids. Kind of hard to believe. I mean, what kind of manpower it would take for humans to build the pyramids, same as, you know, human error causing 15 million doses 
of vaccine to be contaminated. Okay, so it's not impossible. I'm not going to blindly say it's impossible that it was human error, but I can almost guarantee you that with this whole new public-private partnership that the new, uh, well, any administration at this point is going to say that they need, and that partnership involves masterminds and master businesses in the tech world, Amazon, Google, Microsoft, um, well, they wouldn't want you to know that it was actually a hardware or a software issue or that the robots, you know, grabbed the wrong containers and mixed the wrong stuff and put the wrong whatever in the wrong whatever. My point is it was probably more than likely not human error that created 15 million doses of effed up vaccine. Of course, I don't know how we'll ever hear the truth to that story. I'm sure at some point maybe the truth will come out just like in the long run. I imagine 10 years from now, 15 years from now, the truth about the number of deaths attributed to COVID will come out because you know what? There's going to be people studying this who knows how long, number one, psychologically, why did people submit so easily? And that's going to go along with, you know, the death count, the death reports, the new, you know, our governor's screaming about a fourth wave coming at us, that we're on the verge of a fourth wave. And, I'm, you know, at this point anymore, I'm just like, shut the hell up. I'm not even listening to you anymore just scare tactics to make everybody continue this ridiculous bunch of crap we're going through. And I got to say, I'm thankful for having a little piece of heaven to escape to. And hopefully, I hope in some of my stories uh, and some of the stuff I pass on to you, you will find a way to control the things that you can control or to do the things you can to, that actually make a difference, like growing food or entering a partnership with friends who might have property or have, um, have ability to produce food or share you know, gardening or share land with you or offer up some land for you to work on your own or, you know, find ways to just better yourself, uh, your position, whatever it is, you know, not necessarily financially. I think, I think these days what's going to be important is that you have a skill, that you have bartering skills you know, and that uh, and that you can actually get along with people. I mean, the bottom line, or I don't mean get along with people, but are able to um, interact with people in a positive way. The bottom line is, you know, if if right now what we're doing is saying that you either get the jab or you're not going to be, be able to participate in the world anymore. You're not going to be able to go on trips. You're not going to be able to buy things. You're not going to be able to, uh, you know, go to the movie theater or whatever recreation you like to participate in. It's going to be off limits because you don't get the jab. What's going to happen is those people who don't get the jab are going to have to figure out how to survive outside of the mainstream. You know, we're going to have to grow our own food. We're going to have to barter some of our skills with each other. I took the vaccine. I want to, I want it to be clear. I have had the vaccine, the air quote vaccine. Hope to God it doesn't kill me. Like I said before, I'm at the point in my life. I don't care one way or the other. Uh, I think it was a knee-jerk reaction one day. You know, I got an email at work. I'm a healthcare worker. They said, 
you can get the Moderna vaccine. You can sign up wherever. And I was just like, yeah, screw it. I'm going to go do it. I'm old enough that if it kills me, I don't care. If I get COVID and it kills me, I don't care. More than likely, I'll survive COVID. Uh, I, I had an incident at work. I guess I am going to go over a little over an hour. Sorry about that, but I, I guess it's okay. I had an incident at work about uh, three weeks ago. I didn't pass. Oh, it was before I got the shot, actually. So it had to have been over a month ago. Uh, I kind of passed out, but I didn't totally pass out. It was kind of like uh, something was wrong in my head. And... Uh, I couldn't really speak. It was kind of like a stroke. Like I could, I saw the word in my head. I was trying to ask for help and I couldn't get it out. It was probably a TIA. Anyway, what I'm getting to is, so I went through all of this crap in the last uh, week. I had my carotids uh, ultrasounded. I had a cardiac ultrasound. I had a MRI or CAT scan on my head. Everything is perfectly fine. I work out 30 to 45 minutes a day. I ride a stationary bike. I'm in good shape. Um, I doubt, oh, I do smoke, by the way. I should be honest about that. I love nicotine. That's just one of my, I guess, my drug of choice. Uh, but I only started smoking again when we got locked down for COVID. So I'm going to blame the federal government for that. Not really. I did it on my own. But it was when we got locked down for COVID. But, I mean, I'm basically pretty damn healthy. So I'm thinking I'd probably survive COVID anyway, um, like over 99.99, uh, 78% of the population will survive COVID. But that's not a number, I guess, that's uh, politically correct. So you won't hear that so much out there in the open. Um, but anyway... Uh, I guess that's it for today, and it's a good thing you guys are being spared my Microsoft rant, because <laughs> I really, as a matter of fact, uh, if I do a show on Tuesday, if I get that cleared or whatever, I will probably rant about Microsoft and Linux. Uh, it's a personal experience. It was not fun, and reminded me why I hate Microsoft and Windows so much, but that's it for this week. Thanks, everybody, for joining Doc Mike the Redneck Dentist here on Real Liberty Media. I will see you at least next week. Thanks.